since the Kasparov short challenge match a few weeks ago, I've had quite a few requests to look at some more of Gary Kasparov's games and of course I'm very happy to oblige. Uh, of course I've already uh, recorded a playlist of clips featuring Kasparov's games uh, so do check that out if you're interested but let me add one more to those games and this was played when Kasparov was just 18 years old in the World Under-26 Team Championships played in Graz in 1981 and this has always been one of my favourite Kasparov games I remember uh, playing through this game afterwards and being in in, in awe of Kasparov's tactical abilities. So we join the game after 32 moves. Kasparov is black and as he himself says, he thought that white was slightly better here. Uh, you can see that white has the two bishops and has reasonable pressure on the pawn on d5 and white's structure on the king's side is solid, solid enough. By the way, I should say that I'm basing my my comments on Kasparov's own comments in his fantastic book, Kaspar Gary Kasparov, on Gary Kasparov, Part 1, 1973, 1985, published by every man. I can recommend it's worth every penny of the £30, but a, a fantastic book. Um, as Kasparov says here, he's slightly worse. Um, but his opponent offered him a draw here. But Kasparov saw that his opponent was coming into time pressure, so he, he declined the draw offer and played on. So knight e7. So Kasparov's idea was, he said, basically he wants to fling this knight towards white's kingside um, and, you know, let's see what happens. Well, here white played knight d4, maybe not the best, maybe knight d2 is, is better to get rid of this knight on e4. But knight d4 is kind of a very typical move for these isolated queen's pawn positions, you know, occupying the square in front of the pawn. And it's not so bad. But the rook comes to the third rank opposite the king, and now, okay, things start to get a little bit more complicated. Bishop d3 is a good move, ready if necessary to trade off that dangerous knight. Queen d7, so Kasparov nudges back, looking at the pawn on h3, so king h1, and now knight f5, so heading in the direction of white's king. And here, uh, well, you know, with hindsight, Kasparov recommends exchanging off all the pieces, or, well, not all the pieces, but lots of pieces simply to reduce the danger and this is about equal you know both sides have weak pawns here should be about equal let's go back but instead short of time white took on e4 and played rook d2 which at first glance actually looks very sensible indeed it's the kind of decision that you might make uh, when you're short of time, because white's pieces simply look very harmoniously placed. The knight is supported. You know, any trade here is obviously going to be very beneficial for, for black, but Asparov had worked out the tactics. Knight h4. Now suddenly black's pieces are massing on the king side. Now there's a tactical point to this. White's problem is that there's no good discovered attack for this knight. For example, knight f3 doesn't work. Attacking the queen. Because pawn takes, you give up the queen, and suddenly it's checkmate on f3. <laughs> so white played knight e6 to try and trade some pieces try to reduce the pressure on the position but Kasparov exchanged queen for two rooks knight f4 for white and rook g5 
So that's the 40th move, and Sunni NATO played King G1, that's the 41st move, so they've reached the time control. And here, the game was adjourned. Now for those of you in the, the computer age, who don't know anything about adjourn adjournments, this was basically meant that the game was, was stopped, and then sometimes it would be resumed after, say, two or three hours, maybe after a meal break. Sometimes it would be the next day. I mean, I've, I've played games that went on for days and days. So it meant that during that break, you were, of course, allowed to analyse the game as best you could. And the Soviets were always brilliant at analysis with their very classical... Um, chess education. They they really understood how to analyse a chess game very well. And, well, Kasparov sealed the right move here. When I say sealed the move, that means you, you write down the move you intend to make on your score sheet and put it in an envelope and that's sealed, which the arbiter looks after the envelope, and then that's open the next day. So, Kasparov sealed the correct move. Knight F3 check. And here white played king f1, but there's a fantastic variation that occurs after king h1, and this has always really appealed to me. The main variation runs like this. Bishop takes pawn, so first of all you give up your bishop. Well, queen takes leads to mate after rook d1, but what happens after pawn takes bishop? There is a sensational combination. First of all, rook takes pawn. Now this gets taken. But then black plays rook g3, and that forces checkmate. This theme is well known from study composition, but it's very rare that you actually see this in a proper game of chess. And here we have it. White is loads of material up, but unable to prevent mate here. Obviously, if the knight moves, then rook g1 would be mate. Absolutely stunning. So it's a knight f3. So the NATO played king f1. But bishop takes pawn is still fantastically strong. Uh, the tactics work beautifully here. Um, well, the bishop was taken. Let me just show you very quickly what happens if knight e2 trying to block out the rook. There's another beautiful tactic after this. So black is crashing through. But watch how white, uh, black forces checkmate. And then king g2 and rook takes knight is mate. So the bishop's taken here. Another sacrifice. Once again, giving up the rook, but this time it's not mate. Black simply wins the queen with this knight fork and has an overwhelming material advantage. So white moved the queen across, but now with white's king cut on the first rank, black is able actually to win with a winning attack. But this is a nice moment actually, and this is another reason why I really like this game. Here, of course, black would love to move in with the rook, attack the knight and force a checkmate. But now white saves himself with queen c8 check, and then bouncing around, bouncing back with queen f5. So Kasparov first, before moving in with the rook, played king h7. Well, it's very subtle. Uh, White has a whole move to try and avert disaster, but simply hasn't gotten the thing here. Um, but this reminds me of several of other uh, games by Kasparov. For example, uh, two games in the Spanish that he played against Karpov. The uh, 20th game from their 1990 match. And in 1986, he also, I think it was game 16 in 1986, he played... King G in a, in the middle of a raging attack, he played King G one to H two, just moving the king off the back rank before going on with the attack. So it's it's a similar kind of idea. Absolutely beautiful, very subtle. After all the 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 crash and and thud, Queen C eight was played. So once again, Rook G two would be met by Queen F five. But here, Black wins like this, and after Knight D two, Sunio NATO actually resigned. Threat, rook f1, mate. And if the knight comes here, then the rook checks. So the king is forced to the back rank. And here, that's the simplest way to win. 
so black has recovered a piece and well very soon this one is going to go and the king will be checkmated very shortly there you go one of my favorite games um I'm roughly the same age as Kasparov and I remember you know when I saw this game I just thought right I don't think I have a hope of being world champion but I think I might know who the next world champion might be and indeed uh, Gary Kasparov succeeded a couple of years after. Um, if you're interested in looking at more of Kasparov's games do check out the playlist Kasparov on this channel where you'll find lots more examples of his play. Coming up soon I'll be reporting on the Norway chess tournament with Carlsen and well uh, most of his uh, rivals so that's going to be a great one look out for that thanks